OK, so uh, we have four webinars in our Three Steps to Rapid Solver Generation webinar series. And today is webinar three. And uh, we've got a real special guest today. Uh, Adam York of York Family Farms um, is uh, going to be talking about his work that he's done on his farm of transitioning his 10,000 acres, plus uh, also uh, working on uh, all the neighborhood farms and, and expanding that, that business. And then we have a webinar four uh, coming up, which is going to be Meet the Soil Regen Pros. And so that's going to be this Saturday. And it's going to be, you know, uh, a number of consultants. The people are actually out there doing the work. And it's a good opportunity for you to ask questions about what we are actually doing uh, to further the soil food web approach and, and converting a large scale farming into uh, the soil food web. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and continue on. So uh, the topics for today, uh, we'll just do a quick introduction with the, the speakers, the panelists that we have today. Um, and then we're going to do an audience poll. We always like to hear, we have a question for you folks to be able to answer. So we'll take uh, 30 seconds for you to do that. And then part one of our webinar today is going to be talking with uh, farmer Adam York and uh, the work that he's been doing. And then we'll do a quick Q&A uh, after that. So if you have questions, uh, uh, you, you're going to... Uh, hit the Q&A button down below, and I'll have a screen that can describe some of the instructions for that in just a second. And then we'll get into the promotion that we're going on, which is the About the Soul Food Web training program and the offer that we've got. And then part two is going to be um, Adam York and also Todd Harrington, who Todd was working with Adam to make all this transition work. So uh, they'll talk about uh, some of the good work that they're doing. And then we'll finish that with a Q&A session. And so again, um, you know, if you got questions, yeah, go to the Q&A section. So, and we expect that today's webinar is to be about 120 minutes or two hours. Okay, for the panelists today, we've got Dr. Elaine Ingham, of course. Uh, couldn't uh, do this work without her, so this is fantastic to, to have Elaine with us. And then, like I mentioned, uh, Adam York. So he's got York Farms, and so uh, he's farming. He's also now educating about, uh, uh, other farmers about uh, the soil food web approach and, and consulting on, on those large-scale farms. Uh, we've got Todd Harrington, uh, part of Harrington's Organic Land Care. He's a soil food web consultant. We've got Dr. Adam Cobb, uh, which is a soil food web school science uh, communicator. So he's helping us do a lot of the outreach uh, in our uh, soil food web school. We got Dr. Adrian Gottschalks, who's a soil food school science mentor. So helping train the new crop of consultants and lab practitioners that we have out there. And then myself, um, I own a company called Sprouting Soil and I'm a soil food web consultant. All right. Next slide, please. So here's a quick poll. And again, we'll keep it up for maybe a minute or two. Um, and you should see that poll launching into your screens now. All right. And uh, we'll just go ahead and, and that poll will be up until you answer it in the background. So uh, Adrian, we can move on to the next slide, please. OK, and I talked about Q&A. So uh, it's just, you know, we, we like to have this dynamic feedback. We want to hear questions from you to be able to, to have a discussion amongst the panelists. So at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you're going to see a QA and a uh, and your, your question will be recorded. And then I'll be going through and selecting questions. We won't be able to answer every question that's out there, but if you can, um, you know, we will try to answer ones that are going to kind of fit for the theme for today. And uh, please put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, if you put them in chat, they may not get caught and actually put to our question. So if you do have a question you want the panelists to ask, uh, the Q&A section is the right area to go. Okay, so part one, uh, we're going to be talking with Adam York. So Adam, uh, go ahead and take it away. Okay, you hear me okay then? Yep, you sound great. Okay, all right. So hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Adam York. Um, I am a multi-generational we run a multi-generational family farm from uh, Jacksonville, Illinois. Um, I farm alongside uh, my brother, uh, my two cousins, which are and my uncle. So we grow soybeans, corn, and um, we farm ourselves a little over 10,000 acres, probably a little closer to 11,000 now. And then uh, we do help um, some other farmers and locally in the area um, service some of their farms as well. Next slide. Okay, so part of our transition, um, it's it's been it's been an interesting journey, but um, we have uh, we have gotten rid of uh, we don't use any DAP fertilizer, any potash, 
Uh, we do not use any liquid insecticides, um, anhydrous ammonia. Uh, we don't use seed treatments on our soybeans. Um, some of the corn around our area is still hard to get um, some of the seed treatments, um, not without them. Uh, we do not use Roundup anymore. We use some different chemicals, more of a non-GMO um, type chemicals. Uh, we've gotten away from liquid starters. And we have switched uh, still a good chunk of our um, uh, grains from GMO. We used to be all 100% GMO soy and GMO um, corn. And we have switched probably about 95% over to um, non-GMO. I would switch it all. Uh, the problem is with, with some of the dicamba um, around uh, some of our, or our, some of our fields are bordering some of our neighbors too closely. And, they, they do seem to smoke some of our stuff. Um, and we've gotten away from aggressive tillage. Um, I do believe tillage is important if you do need it. If you don't, you know, um, that's one thing that, you know, depends on the soil. But we have went to uh, more of a vertical tillage type uh, tillage system to plant cover crops. And if you do need some sort of tillage, we went more towards a inline ripper. But um, here in the last couple of years, we have not really done any any tillage whatsoever other than a little bit of vertical tillage. So um, a lot of our results, um, we have noticed that um, when we first started this journey, um, our soils were very degraded. It, 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 it more or less, uh, it's pretty easy to see. So we're seeing a lot of improvement there. Um, you know, I couldn't find a earthworm to save our lives. Um, the, uh, the, we were spending way too much money on um, fertilizer, and uh, just the inconsistency was was um, from year to year was just not there for us. And like I said, we could we knew we could needed to change, but didn't know what direction to go in. And this is kind of how the how the journey started. Great. Uh, next slide. Yep. Okay, so this is kind of where it gets kind of fun. But uh, and so in 2012 had a good friend of mine. He actually used to be a, uh, a seed salesman and uh, I've known him for a long time. And, and he was kind of going down a little different route. Um, I never did buy seed from him before, but I, I knew who he was. And uh, anyways, he came by the farm and, and was trying to sell a, uh, got a jug liquid biological product. And, you know, I didn't know, I didn't know a thing about biology at this point in time. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of farmers out there know, you know, what a lot of these salesmen, especially they come out of the woodwork, especially when, when prices are high or whatever, trying to sell, sell you anything and everything under the sun. And uh, pretty much said, yeah, you're, you're selling snake oil. And um, <laughs> we, we took a bet and, um, and more or less, he's like, all right, guys, if it doesn't work, I'm never, ever going to come back to your farm. It's like deal. One less salesman we got to deal with. <laughs> so, uh, um, so we tried it, you know, tried on some small stuff that was actually a drought year for us, but, uh, we do have some irrigation and, um, uh, even where it was drought prone versus under irrigation, um, these trials paid, um, you know, we, we had cut the fertilizer there, um, and did some with no fertilizer or, you know, cut rates of fertilizer. And um, these, these trials paid, um, but like I said, we didn't know why. And that is pretty much, you know, it boggled mine, my mind and um, I just had to figure it out. So, so at that point in time, we were, we were working with agronomists um, and we were doing, I mean, uh, I don't even know, 300 pounds of DAP in some places up to 400 pounds of potash. I mean, it was, we were, we were throwing a lot of money away. So I hired Brad Holbrock, which um, was an agronomist. He worked for a seed company. I've known him for a long time, um, probably since like 2001. I have known him. Um, and he kind of had the same goals as what well, what I had. So uh, we started working together. I think he, he actually went on his own when I we hired him as an agronomist in, 2000, in 2012. But um, we wanted to know why. And this is pretty much where our self-education began. So let's see here. So fast forward a little bit or 
2013-14, we did more trials, okay? We were still working with the same company. Um, we were doing food sources with the biology. Um, we continued to decrease the use of dry fertilizers. That was one of the main things when Brad came on. We, we were variable rating. We were, we were doing a few things, but we were not throwing the type of money that we were in 2012. Um, and like I said, we started educating ourselves. And that's, I think, to this day, it's still very, very important to do that. Surround yourself with good people. But, um, and in 2015, we cut out all fertilizer, DAP potash. Um, and then we started making compost tea. We, uh, Todd says we weren't making very good compost tea then, but it still was working. That's, I think that just tells you how degraded our soils were, that even the stuff that we were making, even though Todd says it wasn't very good, it still was showing some benefit. Um, and then 2016, uh, my partner in AgriBioSystems now, um, and my grounds at the time, uh, Brad contacted Dr. Elaine Ingham because we just had some answers that we um, needed answered and we didn't know who else to call except for um, Ms. Elaine. So she pointed us in the direction of Todd Harrington and that is the, about the time that uh, we all started working together with Todd. Um, Todd started um, helping us with, you know, um, improving our um, extracts, teas, um, our comp making our own vermicompost and yada, yada, yada. So, um, okay, so it's so a part of our transition to region ad. So what we've actually been seeing um, on our farm today versus back when, before we started this is um, we are getting a very healthy um, population of earthworms in our soil, um, more aggregate structure, um, you know, when we first started this, we, we, we had no aggregate structure or any earthworms whatsoever. Um, we were fighting water hemp, a lot of other horrible weeds around our area that, uh, farmers still around this area that are still in the conventional methods are still fighting. Um, we've improved our soil structure. Um, we've gotten rid of some, we've had some, um, some soil compaction layers, um, due to high magnesium levels that um, we have improved those, which has in, in, in turn improved our uh, water holding capacity. Um, we do farm in the Illinois River bottoms where we do have some irrigation, where we have some sands, some gumbos, a lot of different types of soil. Um, we have decreased a lot of our irrigation needs, which is very time consuming sometimes. Um, and we've also backed off our nitrogen use by probably about 60 to 100 pounds, depending on the soil, depending on the situation. And then also we have increased um, our bricks levels in our plants. So like I said here, the big picture benefits is um, lower input costs, which is, you know, especially in today's world guys, where, where fertilizer is really, really expensive. Um, it's a big deal. Um, even when we all thought that they were somewhat affordable. It was still a big deal. Um, yields have improved um, and we are more so self-sufficient self as a farm um, compared to uh, a lot of other farms that are very uh, dependent on, you know, what, what the next guy's going to try to sell them. So challenges, uh, this is, this is always fun. So, you know, no matter when you, any type of change that you're planning on making, you are going to occur some challenges. Um, we have a hard time sometimes, depending on how harvest goes, depending on what rainfall is, getting some covers time, uh, planted timely. We've had some uh, where we planted some, some corn and some covers. We've had some, some tough uh, learning curves there. Um, we've cut back on herbicides. You know, one of the main things is we've gotten away from uh, Roundup, but we have, uh, we have not still completely gotten away from it. I would love to, but we are working on cutting them back. Um, and we have been doing so. Um, and probably I think, you know, at first, you know, it's not, you know, maybe going to this method for us was not pushing the easy button um, like some conventional farming is. Um, so maybe initially it's a little more time consuming, but I think over, over time, I think it's going to be, um, I think you're actually going to have more time. Um, and another challenge is everybody wants to fix soils, you know, obviously as quickly as possible and that depending on everybody's situation is a little bit different and that is, is challenging 
uh, we have a saying that pretty much we say we didn't screw these soils up in one year. We're not going to fix them in one year. So it's going to take a little bit of time. <laughs> <laughs> but you're on the right path. Okay. All right. Where did we save money? So when we first started this, you know, it was, so we talk about budget cuts. It depends on what you do with that money, right? Um, so we were probably saving right out the gate, probably anywhere between $100 to $150 per acre. Some of that cost is obviously less tillage, um, lower on your fuel cost. Um, a big one, a real big one that a lot of guys know is going from a uh, GMO to non-GMO seed. Um, I know a bag of corn for us, if you want to, you know, get it all at, uh, you know, the big GMO seeds, it's going to be $320, $350 a bag where you can get a non-GMO bag of corn for, you know, 150 to 170, depending on your area. You know, that's a, that's a big difference. Um, so and we also, we've cut out all seed treatment. There's a lot of uh, people that are making a lot of money and, and spend a lot of money on seed treatments. There's some people that are spending all the way up to 30 to $40 on a, a bag of beans where normally a bag of beans costs you 30 to $40, you know? Um, we've cut out majority of our fungicide costs. You know, I think uh, as long as you're keeping your bricks levels up and you're doing some of the right things and mother nature's cooperating with you, she hasn't for us for, the last couple of years have been a little tough on that side, but um, that is another cost that you can cut out if you can. Um, and you can also, like I talked earlier, you can cut out between six, or we cut out between 60 and 100 units of nitrogen, and we're still at that point in time where we're at. I mean, my goal is still to try to, you know, produce um, 250 to 300 bushels of corn, and, you know, at this point in time, we're doing it right now at, you know, somewhere around that, between 100 and 140 pounds, 150 pounds of nitrogen, um, depending on the soil. So we, do, we have no uh, potash or DAP cost. Um, we do not use any dry fertilizer, and then we do not use any insecticide. We've cut all those out. So this approach pretty much frees up the budget to spend um, money on things that the crop and the soil needs, whether that's biology, you know, um, or other fertilizers, you know, maybe like a boron or, or a, a molybdenum, you know, certain things like that. Um, and we, we decide a lot of that versus on, um, we do a lot of sap testing. So that's how we kind of come up with, um, you know, what other nutrients are we missing as well. <clears throat> so the, the creation of agrobio systems has been kind of an interesting one. So when Brad and I started going down this road, we had really no ambitions to start a company. Um, but the reason why we did start Agribio Systems was because we, we were doing this on our own farms and it kind of sparked the interest of uh, a few other farmers around our area. Um, they're like, hey, you know, that, that sounds like something that we'd be interested in. So, so we ended up... Uh, going out on a limb and, and saying, all right, if, if, if there's people out there kind of looking in the same direction as we are, we can, I think maybe we can, we can help them. We can obviously help ourselves, um, and, and kind of learn this deal together. So, um, so at this point in time, we do have eight full-time employees, you know, 50 some clients, um, probably a little bit more than that. Um, you know, some are more locally, some are, some are scattered, uh, across the United States. Um, and yeah, we probably work on a hundred thousand acres or so, um, give or take, uh, farms, you know, that are all the way up to 11,000 acres to farms that are 8,000 to 9,000 and farms that are, you know, five to 10, you know? So, um, but one of the things that we do at Agribio Systems is we do tell, try to help educate growers. Um, and the main reason is because um, we're not trying to tell guys, you know, what to do or, you know, but if we can help educate guys on um, why certain things that maybe we promote are important, it, it does it does help make that transition a little bit e easier. Um, and, you know, like I said, a couple of the things we like to ask them is, you know, what, what are your goals? What are you what are you trying to accomplish? 
um, you know, there's a lot of farmers around home. Sometimes they're just trying to get from one year to the next year, you know, um, you know, for me, I have, I have three boys. My brother has four boys. Um, this is about trying to leave, you know, for me, it's about trying to leave this soil better than when I found it. Um, so these guys, so my children don't have to go through possibly some of the, the, the challenges that, that I've had to, um, and we ask growers, what are their challenges? You know, um, everybody, everybody in agriculture has, has certain things that, um, uh, that are challenges and they're tough, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I'm a farmer, I understand it, you know, so it's something that we kind of help, you know, kind of help guys try to work on some of their, uh, challenges. Um, another thing, yeah, we're, you know, trying to, trying to put a, a vision in front of some of our growers, just, to, where do you want to be in five to 10 years? Um, and how are you going to get there? You know, and that's kind of where we come in and try to help, help that. So, um, Self-education is key. The more educated the grower is with good science and information, the easier it is to help them grow and be successful. Um, we can't continue to degrade soils year after year and expect the same results or better results from year to year. So Adam, this slide really resonates with me because that's not, one of the challenges of being a consultant out in the field is um, the education part of it. You know, there's a lot of people who are kind of hearing through the zeitgeist, you know, hey, hey farming with biology, the soil flow approach, but in to be able to really internalize that and change that to the operation, the educational hurdles, one of the things we first got to tackle. So I'm glad to see that that uh, was something that you focused in on and are focusing on with your other clients too. Yeah, I would agree. Yep. Okay, I think we're at the Q&A section, our first Q&A. Um, Adrian, can you uh, share the slide with the first question, or are you still kind of putting that together? And you might be on mute there, Adrian. There we go. All right. All right, perfect. So, uh, Adam, we got a question directed right towards you. Um, you mentioned yep. vertical tillage. Uh, could you explain what you mean by that? That's a question from Joanne. Yeah, so for us, um, we use a, it's a Krauss accelerator, um, 8,000 and I do believe is the number on it and more or less it's got some notched blades that are that are going straight they're not the cup like the old discs um, it's a notched curve not, not curve but they're notched straight blades and they just kind of they're only tilling the soil about mm, inch and a half two inches you can set it um, depending on what you're trying to accomplish but um, on our accelerator we have a seeding unit on that as well and that's how we uh, seed our cover crops is with that just to kind of help incorporate them in the top inch to two inches of the soil. It's what works for us. Um, you know, there's people that do some no-till and, and it's been successful with that as well. But this is what's what's worked for us. But that's that's a piece of equipment that we that we use currently. And would you say that it, it minimizes the amount of disturbance in the soil compared to other tilling techniques that you use in the past? Correct. A lot, a yeah, lot yeah. less disturbing for sure. Right. Yeah. And that's all we're yeah. trying to, you know, we're trying to, if we're trying to build aggregate structure, we don't want to tear it down. You know, it's kind of like building a house. So we're, uh, I don't want to have to build a house every year. I don't want to tear it down every year. So it's kind of, it's kind of the same exactly. concept. Right. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, panelists, any other comments you guys want to make to that question about vertical tillage? All right. Let's move on to question number two. And this one's from Cecilia. And the question is, what about pesticide use? Did you reduce fungicide, bactericide use as well? And I mean, that could go to nematicides and miticides and all those other kind of sides. What say you, Adam, about that? Yeah, so we don't use any sides at all unless we have, which we do use a fungicide here and there if we have to, but any what, otherwise we don't use any of the sides. Um, so we do use, well, other than pesticide, I guess, um, but where we went with pesticides is when we went to non-GMO, we just went more to a non-GMO chemical program. Um, we have incorporated, there's a lot of really good research out there. Uh, I still have a little bit of work to this to do myself, but there is a lot of research out there that guys are using uh, fulvic acid, which we do use fulvic acid helping to reduce um, their rates of, of uh, pesticides. Um, there's a lot of good work out there. Um, that's something that we're still working on. We have cut our pesticide rates. We have not cut them in half, but we have um, 
cut them down as much as another 25% um, and had really, really good luck with it. And I think this year we're going to hopefully be able to do more than that. Um, we just got to get to the point where we're feeling, you know, a lot more comfortable with that. And we have to do trials and you just got to figure out where your comfort level and what you can, what you can't do, you know, so you, so you don't fail. And that's kind of where we're at with yeah. it at this point in time. And would you say year over year, you think even a, you're just on a sliding scale, reducing the amount of pesticide use that your, yep. your pest, yep. pest pressure is just becoming less and less and less. Yeah. Yeah, that is yeah. correct. And I think, you know, some of the exciting exciting things about um, you know pest control is you know the biological side of the house is we need to get better understanding about the life cycle of the pests we're dealing with and trying to attack those life cycles uh, with biological um, you know applications and things like that yep. and uh, you know and I know that there's a lot more science that that's happening in that that realm but uh, I agree with you I think pesticide use so you can uh, reduce and then eventually just phase out yes and that's the goal I mean it's, it's hard to just completely transition and just go cold turkey um, I, I've heard of a lot of people doing that. I think that can be somewhat of a failure, you know, right out the gate. So you just kind of have to, you know, go and, and kind of cut, you know, but also test it too, you know, say, hey, I'm going to go take a strip here and I'm going to do, I'm not going to use any pesticide and see where I'm at, you know, or um, do half a rate, see, see where I'm at there and just, you know, you don't have to do it on big scales, but do it on, a, you know, somewhat of a scale that you can actually uh, prove to yourself. Um, it's no different with nitrogen, you know, prove to yourself that, hey, if I, I'm scared to cut nitrogen or whatever, well, just, just, just take a little bit and, and try it. And that's the only way you're going to prove to yourself that, you know, oh, I can either, I'm, I'm ready for this or I'm, you know, not ready, but play around with different rates. And mm -hmm. that, that, that helps you learn, yeah. in my opinion. Well, and the tricky balance regarding Well, I think you mentioned insects. some diagnostic tools. Oh, go ahead, Adrian. Oh, no, Sorry. that's fine. Uh, the, the tricky balance there is that, you know, once you start to build up this beautiful habitat in your soil and your plant communities, you're drawing in these insect predator communities that if there's any kind of pesticide residues on that, then you're, you're cutting your legs out from under you when you could be using that workforce and community support um, to help just solve the rest of the problem. So at a certain point, it is like a leap of faith that yep, most, yep. <laughs> or, or the opposite, right? You bring them in and you kill them, then you're killing the predators in your area with your pesticides that you're afraid to let go of. Um, like so build there's... those houses again. Every yeah, year, exactly. Right? Build new houses, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and you know, I really like that you brought that up, Adrian. Uh, you can tell that we're two ecologists in the room because I love anything related to this kind of discussion <laughs> so much. Um, I heard a talk by our local um, Xeris Society that focuses on, you know, especially native pollinators and other beneficial insects. And um, most states have an active uh, Xeris Society. If you're in the U.S., there's probably an equivalent group in most international contexts that can help you determine if you have, like, most farms have little areas that is are not economic for, for actually row cropping. And so if you can start to establish the kinds of native plants that draw in the native predator insect populations and give them um, places to overwinter or floral resources like nectars that are specific to them, then, you know, I've observed with my own eyes in home gardening that certain flowers will bring in like parasitic wasps that destroy all the aphids that get on your cabbage, right? Because they're laying eggs inside every aphid and then you can just see, they call them mummies, the, the dead aphids after a while. So what I they look, say- They look like little puffed rice, rice yeah, kernels. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really gross, but it's better than them eating your cabbage, <laughs> right? So, uh, you know, what, what I've seen is when, when, when people make the, the mental transition to thinking about optimizing, especially the nutrient inputs on their um, operations and making that, uh, you know, what Adam referred to is sort of like an investment strategy rather than a kill it, deal mm -hmm. with the fire strategy, then it frees up a little bit of time and resource and energy to think, well, I've got that area over there by the creek I can't crop, but maybe I could establish some beneficial native plants there. And then that just builds over time. You see this like virtuous cycle going on with the ecology of farms. Yeah. I also think it's probably really important to be keeping track of what the biology is 
in your soil, have you gotten the organisms up to the point where they can control, where they've got enough effect on the pest and disease um, problems that you have the workforce to take care of the problems? If you've just gotten barely started getting your bacterium, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, microarthropods up to the right place, if you haven't gotten there yet, you can't be expecting that these organisms are going to take care of all of your problems right away. If we can get all of that biology back into the soil, we see that we can do this in a year. But if you know, for one, one reason or another, it takes a while to get those microorganisms established, well, then go at it more slowly. Go with reducing your nitrogen by X amount, by um, putting on fulvic acid so you'll have some of the pesticide um, and uh, fungicide um, effects of those materials, feeding the organisms, getting rid of your problems little by little it'll increase so it's kind of up to you as growers up to us um, to encourage our clients to be moving along that sequence as rapidly as possible yeah and i i keyed on something that adam had mentioned too that you know it's not like we have to make it a guessing game there's a lot of diagnostic tools to help you make decisions about this plant sap yep. analysis tissue analysis soil chemistry microbiology assessments all that data then helps you yeah, exactly helps you build this picture of saying okay here's what's happening and here's what we need to do and you know you can be very smart and specific and prescribed about what you're trying to do versus just a guessing game all, all right our next question is related so i thought i'd pop this up here go on perfect and i I love this question. So Anya, um, I think this is a fantastic question. Uh, groups and people that work in Regen Ag often claim to work with biology, but use compost tea blindly without checking the biology in the microscope or even seem to understand what it is, calling it a fluid fertilizer. I know that Regen Ag is an open field, but it is frustrating seeing the lack of precision when using compost tea. How do you handle the wide tent that this field of agriculture is open to? And Boy, Elaine, I think this question is geared right to you because your work has been focused really <laughs> on this question, right? Yeah, where you have to be finding out what those sets of organisms are in your soil. So where are you starting from? What's missing? How much of it are you missing? And then how are you going to get those organisms established in your um, soil? So how rapidly can you convert your dirt back into soil? And I think we've just got to re remain steadfast, reminding people that they do have to know what they're doing. It, you know, you're not going to just throw a firebomb on something and cross your fingers and hope that it's going to come out with the right kinds of microorganisms left in the soil, because most certainly it is not. You need to be measuring. It's, you know, how can we manage if we can't measure? And that's what the biology, the microscope work, the biology in the soil is all about. You need to be measuring the organisms. Do you have what you need? And then remember that it's not just looking at um, your soil as if it's one um, way of existing because soil is constantly trying to improve itself. A disturbance comes along, you're gonna go backwards. And then you get to restart fixing the problem again. And if you disturb before the biology is established, you're going to go backwards. So how many times do you have to do the back and forth game until you understand you need to be keeping an eye out on your microorganisms? You don't have to be really serious, you know, um, seriously um, you know, pinpoint in your answer. We don't need three place decimal uh, precision and uh, we can do more of a qualitative test. You yourself could be looking at your soil once a week and um, it's gonna take you 20 minutes to get an idea of whether this field has a decent level of organisms or not. So, you know, the reliance on quantitative analysis is important several times during the growing season but in between 
you can be taking really quick and easy to do assessments just having come and worked with us for uh, you know, going through the foundation courses, for example, the fourth foundation classes teaching you how to use a simple microscope and getting um, qualitative comparisons of here's where we started. We've uh, increased it by, by a, fa a factor of two. We need to increase it by a factor of 10. And so you just keep working for that goal, knowing that you'll get there as rapidly as possible, hopefully. Hey, hey, Elaine, I have a quick question, Brian. Can I ask Elaine a quick question regarding this? Sure, yeah, yeah, good point, yeah. So a lot of clients uh, are doing this, applying these compost teas kind of randomly without testing at least, you know, direct microscope plate counts. And yet they're doing, you know, they're having companies come in doing pretty expensive tests, doing the uh, PLFAs and the DNA testing. And so they're getting all the different, you know, species and, uh, you know, doing these uh, expensive tests, but yet they're not doing direct plate counts with their biology, their compost and their extract. Well, well you don't, you talk. don't ever, you don't ever want to waste your money on plate counts. That's the most meaningless thing that you can do thinking that you're learning something about the organisms in your soil. 99% of the organisms that are in your soil cannot and will not grow on plate cultures in the laboratory. They just, sorry, it's a waste of your time and money. Um, PFLAs were showing that that has nothing to do with uh, the biomass of, ba of the bacteria and fungi. Most fungi don't make the PLFAs, the, the phospholipid fatty acids. They just don't make that PL, the simple, easy to determine PFLA. So the, you're not getting an estimate of that fungal biomass. You're not getting an estimate of the protozoa or the nematodes, good or bad. So it's, you know, again, it's another waste of your time. Now, microscope work, yeah. That's what it we want to be doing. Yeah. It's a big difference if people don't realize that. Right? Mm -hmm. It's easy to, the, you know, yeah. Both of the folks that have gone through the courses, you know, they, they being able to do the microscope work is, is really, really important when you're doing this, uh, you know, um, looking at the, the extracts and the actives, you know, and that's something that Adam's done a great job with. They have it. We've got them. They've got a microscope and they're always looking at their stuff. Always. Yep. Right. And that, that gives you an idea of whether you're moving things in the right direction. Why keep putting on something that's actually making you go backwards? And if you don't make your, your compost tea correctly, you can push the biology backwards into a worse condition where you're going to be promoting diseases and pests. So you want to make certain if you're going to take the time to make a compost tea, let's take the um, 20 minutes to look at what's in there and is it going to improve your soil or not? If the answer is not, go put it someplace else where you still have a problem. Yeah, Even I've once we have a good compost tea. Sorry, Brian. Go ahead, Adrian. No, go ahead. Even once we have a good compost tea, thinking about the things, the other practical elements like you're describing, Adam, thinking about how you navigate your field and work with your practices to make sure to support the, the biology that you get out there, you have to reassess and make sure they're actually establishing um, and make sure, you know, like you're saying, the asides, you try to keep as many of those asides out of there. I like to say, let's leave the asides aside. Yeah, but, um, you know, and that's the truth. And we're, we have, uh, so we bought a uh, crimper, oh, a couple years ago. And our plan is, you know, we're going to try to transition a couple hundred acres over, you know, and and roll and crimp. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, uh, organic guys that are doing a lot of tillage, you know, which whatever. But we're we're our, my plan is to maybe do some more cover crops, crimp it, plant a crop into it, and kind of go that transition. Um, to get away from insects or, you know, pesticides, you know, at the end of the day, so. I'd encourage you to look into short, low growing ground covers instead yes. of something that you got to roll and crimp because I can never get out there at the right time to roll and crimp and get the result I want. It's just, my life is too complex. I just, 
You know, it's like you look out the I window could. and you go, darn, I should be out there rolling and crimping and I could take care of the problem. But I'm not going to be back home until next Sunday. So yeah. <laughs> it's. Ah. I agree. I think uh, some low lying covers would be. Yep. So um, we have a whole list of things that we've been working with and people are starting to show which ones are the the best for their kind of land dichondrate repens which is the temperate dichondra not the the tem t um, tropical dichondra that's that is a weed you want to make sure you get the right kind of dichondra and because you have wet springs the dichondra is going to grow get established take over but they never grow more than maybe you know three to five inches and that's it so they're self-seeding when they make seed. They maintain themselves over the years. Well, you want more diversity than that. So throw about 20 different plant seeds out there and get them established. In They'll share the space and they'll give you lots of benefits. So try a small area this, this growing season, perhaps, with a bigger mix of yep. um, ground covers. You know, this is a really interesting area of ours to discuss. Um, and I'd love to also engage Todd and Adam and hear all of your thoughts about, you know, the goal here is just to keep those roots healthy and in the ground, right? And to keep our crops supplied with healthy structured soil and protect that soil surface. So I'd love keep to hear more about for both of you, how you've been able to do that practically out there. Keep Both those crops. nutrients coming. <laughs> Yeah, cover crop technology is really advanced. Looking at, you know, the, even the exudates, right, Elaine? The different exudates that are being produced by these different uh, cover crops, how they benefit the biology and also the intended crop. Um, I know, Adam, there was a one of your fields that got flooded. We, you uh, planted a lot of sorghum. And, yeah, it was uh, 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 Sudan. Sudan yeah, sorghum. Yep, and we, uh, I remember looking at the biology and we were lacking something, I don't know if it was protozoa or what, but after a season of putting that in, it really brought the biology back around within a season. There we, were, we were seeing a lot of beneficial nematodes in it after just that one year. Right. With, right, with the covers helping um, right. with that, so. That was a flooded soil. That's the soil that got really flooded. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can grow anything, I don't think, on that. That's so amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, Todd, you need to be talking with Adrian because she's a chemical ecologist. <laughs> so she knows all of those, uh, you know, what are the waste products? What are the secondary metabolites? What are the tertiary metabolites? And yeah. Adrian gets talking to me about that. And I kind of like, okay, I've had enough. You know, I need to go <laughs> digest for the next two weeks. Let's have another it's conversation. Um, <laughs> uh, grinning and smiling. But, exactly. you know, it, it goes back to the original topic, Brian, when we were talking about, um, you know, the, the, the reason and the need to do the, 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 the actual microscope work. Yeah. We wouldn't have known this unless we took samples and looked at it. But everything that Adam does, he always throws under the scope, you know, the uh, and, and that's really played out really well going forward on making decisions. For sure. You know, and it's interesting. I, I look at the regenerative ag space, you know, this, you know, what we're doing, like at the soulful web approach. It is an emerging market. Um, you know, the science has been around for quite some time, but to really start to transition large scale, it is really starting to gain momentum and starting to change. And with that, I am seeing a tremendous amount of new products coming on the market that are claiming to be biological. Uh, and it's really hard for you know, my growers because I get constantly inundated. Well, what about this product? You know, the salesman trying to sell me this. What about that? What about this? Um, and uh, it, it, I have a feeling the market's going to be in that little bit of a potential some snake oil salesman kind of stuff out that you have to really pay attention to. What we've been trying to do is really to set some consistency, some sh you know, straightforward practices that really can help our growers and education, work with a microscope and getting uh, our farming community educated in that space, I think will help tamp down some of that snake oil salesman uh, you know, activity that's out there. Well, that's interesting because a lot of the reason that Adam and Brad started AgroBio was because they were buying products from other salesmen and they sure. decided to go directly to the source and get the raw materials. Yeah. So yeah. I'm sure Adam well, talk a little bit about I, I'd say 
probably over half of my clients that um, were, are, had already gone down the road of biological before I got to them. Um, and then I go look at the products that they're putting on that are supposed to be biological products. And you look at it, and you're like, wow, there's there's nothing in here. Maybe a lot of bacteria, but there's no fungi, no protozoa. Right. There's nothing to make constitutes a soil food web. And like, you know, Adam, it's kind of funny because Adam was saying, hey, I bought a product that was probably suboptimal, but I did see a benefit. <laughs> and I see that all the time. Where it's like, well, I applied this. I, I got something, you know, I helped control a little bit of powdery mildew. I helped do something. But it's like, okay, your potential is so much yeah. larger. We're going yeah. <laughs> to yeah. really take a look at, at, you know, how we can optimize, you know, the microbiology in that soil. And we don't. Uh, we really don't want to be bringing alien species that, you know, they isolated it in Pennsylvania. And now here you are in Illinois. Uh, those aren't the right sets of organisms to grow in your soils under your conditions with your crop species. And so, mm -hmm. you know, you've actually, when, with that mixture, you, you actually only put out a lot of food, perhaps, to grow a lot of bacteria but it got your indigenous bacteria going. And that was the real reason why it works so well. So, you know, really being absolutely sure about what's causing the benefit. Well, you know, we uh, need to interpret things correctly. And I don't think you can do that if you have no idea of what actually happened. Right. Well, I gotta tell you, Adam's gotten pretty good at micro herding. I got his guys to start going out into the local indigenous environment. And we have kind of a funny story, right, Adam? When I, way back in the day, we were looking for some fungal food. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. you're like, well, I don't know where we're going to get wood chips. And then, you know, I turn around, look across the street, and there's a big goddamn pile of wood chips. <laughs> and you walk down like, there, oh. and sure enough, it's like, holy mackerel. You start digging into it, right, Adam? And um, yeah, you're, you're like, like, look at all this rhizomorph and all, you know, using all these terms that I wasn't yeah. really aware of at yeah, the yeah. time. But um, they're like, Tell me about this. I'm like, oh, well, I, I just remember there was a guy that dumped some wood chips down here about four right, years right, ago. Right. I don't know. There, there they are. Gold so, mine. Yeah. Now well, we've, gotten, gold mine. we've gotten pretty good about uh, finding local sources because Todd's helped us, you know, and uh, just, you know, most everybody has them. You know, you just have to open your eyes to what you're looking for at the end of the day, you know. Right. So, yep. Yep. That's and brilliant. I do. I do feel compelled as the mycorrhizal ecologist in the room to say, I really hope people are cautious with mycorrhizal inoculum because I've been involved in research where we took commercial sources of mycorrhizae and trialed them and found in some cases that they helped invasive weeds grow better. In other cases that they decreased the um, growth of the target or crop species and um, the, the other scary thing is we turned some of those inoculum into our um, testing lab and they said these things are off the charts on nitrogen and phosphorus like they've hidden the companies that are producing these so sometimes hiding a bunch of um, inorganic fertilizers nitrogen, in there. Inorganic yeah. Right. Yeah, sulfurs yeah. and things mm -hmm. like that and so it's right. uh, nothing to do with the mycorrhizal fungi mm -hmm. the spores won't even germinate and grow given those high levels of nitrogen phosphorus <clears throat> etc. So it's just, you know, complete moonshine. And yeah, so if we can <laughs> yep. find local ways, you know, I dream of a, of a situation where, you know, every region of the world, there's people that are um, using methods to cultivate the native mycorrhizae from that area and that those become available because it's very powerful along with everything else when you reestablish the soil food web, those those mutualistic partnerships, especially for grasses, are phenomenal, but don't put the wrong thing in there. <laughs> right. Well, and I want to okay. give a props real quick here, because I just think it's so incredible what Dr. Laningham has created to be able to empower us all to take what's growing around us, create and understand how to create healthy compost, get that out onto the field, and really start this movement. So thanks for doing what you do, Elaine. <laughs> Got it. Second that, third that. <laughs> okay. Um, well, we had a lot of great, great questions. I say let's move on to our next part of the webinar, and uh, we'll continue our Q&A at the end of our next section here. 
Um, so I think we're going to talk about our promotion that we have running. And so uh, this is the biggest discount we've offered, and it's going to be available through January 25th. So the time frame is coming up shortly here. And there are limited places available for the uh, promotion that we're running. And uh, we're going to watch a video that's going to describe about our new bundle, which is going to be the uh, BioComplete Compost Bundle. And then we'll also talk about the Consultant Kickstarter Bundle. So Adrian, if you want to go ahead and kick that video off, and panelists, if you go on mute. This month, we're presenting our biggest bundle with the biggest savings. With the Consultant Kickstarter Bundle, you can register for the Soil Food Web Foundation courses with Dr. Elaine Ingham for just $38.70, saving over $1,100 through October 21st. You'll also get Stage 1 of the Consultant Training Program totally free, saving a further $15.40. That's 26 hours of mentor time dedicated to helping you make your own biological compost and develop your microscopy skills to the standard required to qualify as a certified soil food web lab technician. You'll also get two free bonuses with this offer, the Introduction to Permaculture course by Graham Bell and the all new Soil Sponge Regeneration Workshop with Dee Dee Pursehouse, saving a further $500. This is the biggest discount bundle we've offered with a total value of over $7,000, for which you'll only pay $38.70, saving you over $3,100. That's 45% off. There are limited places available with the Consultant Kickstarter Bundle, so please don't delay. In Foundation Course 1, you'll take a deep dive into the science and methodology that underpins the soil food web approach, which was developed by Dr. Elaine Ingham over the last four decades. You'll study the history of soil on planet Earth and how the agricultural practices we've been using in the last hundred years have degraded our soils to the point where we now only have around 60 harvests left according to the United Nations. You'll learn about the solution to many of the problems that are familiar to farmers all over the world today. Problems like diminishing soil fertility, pest and disease pressure, low crop yields, drought, flooding, compaction, and soil erosion. Regenerative agriculture can address all of these problems. You'll be introduced to regenerative practices like no-till and the use of cover plants. You'll also learn about the four major groups of microorganisms that drive soil regeneration and how the process can be accelerated by restoring the microbial community or soil food web to your client soils. Dr. Elaine will present a number of case studies from around the world that she has worked on personally. Here you'll see some of the amazing results that have been achieved using the soil food web approach. In Foundation Course 2, you will learn all about the importance of biological compost and how it's very different to regular compost. When most people look at compost, they only see a means of delivering nutrients to their plants, so they think about how much nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, and other elements are in the compost. When we look at biological compost, we see a means of inoculating the soil with beneficial microorganisms so that the soil ecosystem can start to function again providing plants with a continual supply of nutrients. This is kind of like teaching someone to fish so they can feed themselves for life as opposed to just giving them a single meal. In this part of the training, you will learn how to make biological compost using various starting materials to create a recipe that will produce results. You'll learn how to monitor and control moisture levels, aeration, and temperature in order to ensure that beneficial microorganisms are multiplied while disease-causing organisms are destroyed or become dormant. You'll also learn about the various types of equipment that can be used at different scales, and you'll learn about the different ways in which biological compost can be applied to the soil. In Foundation Course 3, you'll study Dr. Elaine's methods for making liquid biological soil amendments. Compost extracts are used as a soil drench, delivering microbes deep into the soil profile, where they can interact with the plant's root system. Compost teas are applied to the plant's foliage, where they form a protective barrier against foliar diseases. In time, as your soil biome becomes more diverse and vigorous, your plants and trees may be entirely covered with beneficial microbes without having to continually apply them. In Foundation Course 4, you'll focus on four major groups of microorganisms in the soil food web, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and nematodes you'll learn how to use a compound microscope to identify and quantify these microbes so that you can really see what's going on in your compost and in the soil. This will give you the ability to assess the quality of your compost and liquid amendments before you invest all the time and effort that is required to apply them to the soil. 
You will also be able to monitor the progress of the microbial community in your soil over time. So if something is going wrong, you will know about it before the plants start to suffer. This gives you the opportunity to take remedial action early on in the growing season. In stage one of the consultant training program, you'll be assigned to one of our highly skilled mentors, some of whom are soil food web consultants who run their own businesses supporting farmers to make the transition to the soil food web approach. And others are PhD biologists who have been working closely with Dr. Ingham for several years. You'll work one-on-one -on -one with your mentor to develop your compost making and microscopy skills. When it comes to making great biological compost, there are many variables and every situation is different. Our mentors have worked with dozens of students making compost in many different conditions, so they'll be able to help you address some of these challenges that are unique to your location. They'll also guide you to avoid making common mistakes that can cost you lots of time, money, and effort. Your mentor will support you as you develop your skills to the required standard to pass the microscopy proficiency assessment. Achieving this standard will give you the confidence to really know what's happening in the microbial community in your compost and soil. You'll be able to identify and quantify the four major groups of microbes in the soil in about an hour or less. Once you successfully pass the microscopy proficiency assessment, you can elect to be listed on our website as a certified soil food web lab tech, which means that you can assess soil samples for other farmers and growers in your region. You'll have a total of 26 hours of mentor time so you can arrange Zoom calls and exchange emails with your mentor whenever you feel you need help. Our mentors work together as a team and there's lots of diverse experience and knowledge between them, so you'll have access to a great deal of support. You'll also have access to the two bonus courses. In the Introduction to Permaculture course, you'll learn from internationally respected teacher, author, and lecturer in permaculture, Graham Bell. This is a series of 18 lectures and quizzes where you will take a deep dive into this amazing design system that can be applied when designing your home, garden, farm, business, or community. Permaculture is all about being in balance with the planet and is an ideal tool to have in your bag whenever you're considering making a change. The Soil Sponge Regeneration Workshop is delivered by educator and author Dee Dee Persaus. This five session course is all about regenerating the soil sponge for flood, drought, and wildfire resilience. It builds on the successes of innovative land managers around the world who are saving huge sums and damages from extreme weather events and crop diseases while restoring the dignity and profitability of farming. Didi teaches participatory workshops both in person and online, helping to show the nested relationships between soil health, human health, water cycles, and climate resiliency. So just to recap, the Consultant Kickstarter Bundle comprises the Soil Food Web Foundation courses with Dr. Elaine Ingham, where you get to study the theory and application methods behind the Soil Food Web approach, and that all-important 26 hours of mentor time in Stage 1 of the Consultant Training Program, designed to help you develop your compost making and microscopy skills. You'll also get the two free bonuses, the Introduction to Permaculture course with Graham Bell and the Soil Sponge Regeneration Workshop with Dee Dee Persaus. This bundle is ideal if you want to kickstart your new career as a soil food web consultant. Once you have completed the foundation courses in Stage 1 of the Consulting Training Program, you will be well positioned to complete your certification and be listed as a soil food web consultant on the school's website. With these programs, you'll be on the path to a meaningful and impactful career as the soil food web consultant or biological compost producer. All right. Okay, so we're going to move on to our part two, where we're going to have Todd and Adam talk about uh, the operation that they've kind of created here. And... This is the fun part when I try to escape. This month. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it always takes over. <laughs> Let's it do does. This. We're just going to get out of it and come right back. And then, yeah. Skip that, that slide. That is very exciting. Move on to yep. <laughs> <laughs> it is frozen in full funny. screen. All right. There you go. View. Escape, escape. Um, yeah, our programs that? are a blast. Pressure. My students are the best. Uh, <laughs> sign up. It's it's great. I agree. Yeah. I second that. Okay. 
Okay, uh, so we're going to be, like I said, moving on to part two. Um, and so we'll just we'll almost we can talk about the next we'll just... webinar and then oh, we're there. thank you. Sorry, yep. I forgot about that. So, yeah, Great. webinar four, which is meeting the Soil Regen Pros. So, that's going to be Saturday. Um, and we're going to have Todd, uh, who's already on the panelist today, we'll have Casey uh, Ernst and Keisha Wheeler from Catalyst Bio Amendments. Um, and then we have Ronald Flores from Flores and Systems. We have Eric Filer from High Desert Soil Works, and we have myself from Spiral Soil. And this will be a good opportunity for folks to be able to ask questions about uh, the consultant works that we do, you know, and how we go about it, and how do you become a consultant, and all that kind of good stuff. Okay. All right. So part two, Adam York and Todd Harrington. So you guys take it away. So right. Adam. Go ahead, Todd. So. Um, yeah, so we, uh, we've been working together for quite a while now and, um, you know, every year, uh, Adam, like many other farmers have challenges and, uh, I think both, uh, 2000 and 2001, uh, Adam was challenged by excessive rain, a rainy season, um, certain fields got flooded again. Uh, and you know, once, once you get these conditions, there's not a lot you can do. I'm, if anything, Adam might be able to talk a little bit about how these fields might have been able to recover a little bit better. Um, but really, you know, there's a certain point where when the soils are so saturated, no matter how much you do biologically or organic or regeneratively, there's limitations, especially when it comes to weather. So Adam, maybe you could just talk briefly about, you know, those challenges and maybe how it's important to have a contingency factor maybe on how, you know, we're going to, keep those crops from going south completely, uh, especially when it comes to nitrogen. Yeah, so uh, for us in 2019, I think it was for a lot of people, it was um, very wet in our area. And then another, we were very wet again this year, um, especially in certain areas. So I think one area we had uh, down on our river bottoms, we had 54 inches of rain from April 1 to, I do believe it was the end of August, um, which is, you know, twice as much as what is on norm. Um, so there's kind of been some interesting things that, that we have done. So in 2019, we, there was 2,400 acres that we couldn't even plant. Uh, it was so wet. And by the time we could even plant, it was, um, I do believe it was the first part of August. So that's when we just chose just to go ahead and grow a bunch of cover crops just to help build the soil. Um, it seems like what, what we found out is the soil is pretty resilient. So you just have to kind of come up with, um, um, you know, try to be as synergistic with the soil instead of antagonistic. You know, there's the, you're, you're going to be certain every farmer is going to, um, have certain challenges they face and it's going to differ from year to year um, and just trying to make the best decisions um, to help build your soils at that point in time um, it, it is, is pretty key. So we had that issue and like this year we, we, we did have a crop it, down south that was not very good after that much rain but we did choose to um, you know we did some foliars. Um, there's certain things you know when you get in those circumstances, it's, it's, it's really challenging to overcome them, but um, we're, we're the type of people that we, we don't give up very easily. So there are certain things that you can always do to help um, better yourself um, in the crop. I, I think what's important here too, Adam, though, is that you didn't, like most conventional farmers, right away started playing, applying fungicides because obviously we had quite a few diseases in those fields because of the excessive rain and things going anaerobic. So instead of applying a fungicide, you just let the crop do its thing. And obviously you didn't have good yields, but you didn't go, you know, switch to a fungicide and try to save the crop. Exactly. There's, there comes a point in time where, yeah, it, you know. You so what's the difference in cost though, if you were to apply a fungicide and save that crop versus let it go and let nature take its course? You know, I mean, everything's gotten pretty expensive anymore. So yeah. 30 bucks an acre plus application, you know, mm -hmm. and in certain in certain circumstances, you know, um, it, it's not worth it. But, um, you know, when when crops are good, we've, we've not used 
fungicides. You know, it's just it's one of those things. It's a tool that, you know, I think in agriculture, when you're making the transition, all these things are tools. It just depends on, you know, what what goals you have at the end of the day. You know, I do believe in, in what you're trying to accomplish. So here we are back, you know, 2007, you guys are producing about 3,500 gallons. We had a bunch of the uh, uh, growing earth solution brewers. The biggest ones they had were 500 gallons. And why don't you tell us a little bit about how much work that was. And <laughs> when we were testing those brewers, you know, you know, and I don't mean to say brown water, but um, there wasn't a lot of biology there. And I think some of the results were based on some of the the inputs, the amendments probably, and the sugars and the humates and the kelps that were in there is probably where we were seeing some response on the crops. But you've, you've gone a long way since then. So, you know, tell us a little bit about, you know, the originally starting how challenged you were doing the activated aerated compost tea with the seven 500-gallon brewers. Yeah, so when we first go on, went went to the uh, compost tea. Um, we had seven of these brewers and we were brewing up tea. We were getting compost from not locally. Um, we were getting it from actually California, um, shipping it in, um, getting a food source, you know, and making these teas. So my brother and I would be, and we had a couple other guys that were helping us at the time, but we were, when we first started this, we were pretty low budget. We had an old Quonset um, that it's, when it's warm outside, it's hotter in the Quonset than it is outside. And when it's cold outside, it's colder in that building. It's just, it was not ideal, but we were just at least working with what we had at that point in time. Um, and we, were, we weren't getting much sleep during planting season when this started. Um, but when we were doing this, I mean, we, we were seeing some value. You know, like, like Todd said, was it from, you know, some of the, the food that we were adding, what it was? You know, we were at least seeing some value, but we were also understanding that we weren't going to be able to live our lives very, very good if we continued get down this road, because um, I probably would have been divorced. Uh, my wife would. <laughs> yeah. would so it comes to a point in time where you have to, you have to still have to have a life too. So um, we got with, with uh, Todd and uh, we were looking at this tea and he's like, Oh, you know, there's so many things we can do to help improve what you're doing. Um, we ended up choosing to go to um, compost extract um and uh did a lot of work on our food sources todd has helped us i mean we've we're still working on uh you know we we do uh, our own vermicompost source all our stuff local sources from around home um we're working on uh right now we're working on a uh, highly fungal compost that we have uh working on in the in the shed um we're fortunate enough now that we um we've built a building um that <laughs> that is not like what we had before, but um, we do have a uh, worm room, what we call it, and uh, we have a vermicompost, and we do keep keep uh, the temperature regulated in there, which which helps um, a lot. Um, so yeah, so we went from working um, crazy hours making tea to switching over to an extract. We have an extractor, and uh, producing, you know, a continuous flow extractor, which makes, I don't know, about, I would say 1,700 to 1,800 gallon an hour um, continuously. So um, it's made our lives a lot easier. And then we add the food sources to the extract as they're hitting the planter or um, sprayer or however you're, you choose to apply it. Yeah, so when I saw the size of Adam's operation, I'm going, wow. They're, you know, they were really limited by time and volume at that 3,500 gallons, not to mention the amount of time and labor costs to clean and disinfect and, and kind of get to the next batch. So we went from 3,500 gallons to, you know, uh, you know, producing uh, in a day anywhere from 10 to 20,000 gallons. That's a big difference. And I jokingly said to Adam, I said, once you go extract, you don't go back, you know, jokingly. <laughs> and... Uh, in a way, when it comes to production and doing large scale uh, crops like this, I mean, really the extract plays very well uh, when it comes to the volume thing and also the stability thing and also the cleaning thing. So, you know, not that ex uh, actives don't have a place because they definitely have a place. Yeah. But at this point in time, it made a lot of sense to get Adam going into developing the, the extracts and producing his own compost and 
So, you know, uh, so we went and just in one season, though, Adam went from being able to only produce 3,500 gallons in a couple days to producing 10 to 20,000 gallons a day with the extract. So I'm sure that was, as Adam can contest, it was a big, big savings and a big improvement in their capacity to produce more, more biology, even if it wasn't. Yeah, and I so, think you hit the head on the, or hit the nail on the head too, Todd. I mean, there is a place for tea, you know, in, in our operation, it just made a lot more sense to this, you know, I was not going to be able to keep help. Um, and just the logistics of it, it's just, just, you know, what worked for us. Yeah, maybe talk a little of the detail. We'll go to the next slide about how we were utilizing the extract in the spring in furrow during planting. Yeah, so, okay, so this is how we set up our new building. Um, so I'll start over here. The tank on the left is just, it's just kind of a mixing tank, how we, how we do certain things. But over, you can kind of almost see, it's kind of blurry, but on the right side of the picture, whatever, you can see our, our uh, extractor there. And Todd's sitting there, and you can kind of see it's got a place for um, our vermicompost. You add that vermicompost into the extractor. Um, it's got water um, jetted into it, and it's extracting um, the microorganisms and the nutrients out of the vermicompost and making an extract. So over on the left side, the white tanks, we color we. We did this on purpose. We, we bought two different colors of tanks just for easy. But on the right side, you have the blue tanks. Those are just our water tanks. Um, so we get water come in. The, the pH of our water is a little high. Um, but we use uh, fulvic acid to, um, to help bring the pH down. And then the white tanks on the left are where our comp compost extract um, goes into. So you can kind of see on the back side of these tanks, on the bottom, you can kind of see some hoses down there. You can't really see them real well, but we have pumps. And those pumps um, are circulating um, on timers. They will go on and they will vortex the, the extract to keep it in good shape. Uh, but we have all this stuff uh, set up on digital timers. So it works out really well. But those are 2,500 gallon cone bottom tanks with about, they're about a 30, 30 degree 30 degree cone on them. Yeah, so the, um, on the slide on the right, if you could go back, thank you. Um, Adam had several different types of compost that he was extracting. So you'll mm -hmm. see a couple different bins and at times we might be using different sources of vermicompost or compost. It might be more fungal, it might be more of a vermicompost. So he was definitely good about you know trying different combinations of different mixes to get that diversity into his product um, yeah it's a good thing you brought that up todd because every every year todd todd gets together with us you know several different times a year actually we got uh we're gonna get together here this next month as well and we do a lot of work on um improving you know always you're always trying to fine tune and and improve the the compost that you're you know creating and um so we, we do a lot of different things. And at the end of the day, we, we um, look at all these under the scope and uh, try to figure out what the best mix is to kind of get to where we want to get to at the end of the day. So we might be adding um, three or four different types in and mixing them together. And also the water source, Adam, you know, uh, maybe you can just explain the two different sources of water. We had a well, and then we had city water. We looked at the water, we analyzed it, and then we ended up doing some things to the water, you know, doing some structural things to the water. And also uh, the pH thing, which you mentioned, was important because your original pHs were pretty high. I'm certain. I don't know which source. Yeah, our pH on the on the city was was like nine. Um, the yeah. well was a lot better. Yeah. Um, depends on where you're at, you know, and how much water you need. Um, if we do use the, the city, we, we are storing it in storage tanks, letting letting it blow off. Um, That's not in the picture, though. I mean, those are what, 10,000 no. gallon tanks? Yeah, we have two 10,000 gallon tanks, holding tanks. And um, and then those go into these. So we, we have actually 30,000 gallons of, of uh, water storage, two 10,000s, and they end up going into these tanks here. And that's where we t treat it with the. Uh, the fulvic acid to help bring the pH down in it. 
Now, we didn't, you know, obviously, as Lane knows, and she talks a lot about humic and fulvics, the uh, fulvic and the humics are something we always use, especially to dechlorinate the water. But also, we in this situation, we're using it to lower the pH, but yet we know it's compatible with the biology. And it's a Correct. great product to use um, where some people might use potass, uh, phosphoric acid, let's say, you know, which is pretty detrimental to the biology to lower the pH. So we're really sensitive to those kind of things. And uh, Adam found a good recipe on you know how, what kind of rate to use of the fulvic on a regular basis in these batch tanks to the right that you see there, or on the left, the, the bluer color tanks are the, yeah. the water tanks that have been uh, spiked with the fulvic. So yeah, if you, you want know, to- Water quality has become much more of a problem too, uh, recently, oh, just yeah. because sources of water are becoming difficult. People are drilling deeper. They have high levels of bicarbonates and things like that. So treating your water is really important. Yeah. I'm glad you guys brought that out. So we, we did this before. We, we had the slide already, but this is, Adam, if you just want to kind of summarize the how many pivots you have and how many pivots you're injecting with the uh, the extract or the actives. And I think this this one, you were actually, we had an extract that we brought in the uh, in the tankers, and then we downloaded it to, and, and Adam's really great about being innovative with equipment and utilizing old equipment that otherwise would go out into the to pasture, huh. was uh, <laughs> these seven-gallon, you know, expensive tanks, these yeah. brewers, he no longer needed anymore. So what he did is he put them on trailers and then brought them to the pivots. We would download the extract, add the food, because these brewers already had aerators on them, and they, uh, if the the location didn't have power, then he we had a generator uh, that would generate the uh, regenerative blowers so that we could activate the extract for a certain period of time, and then it would get injected. Yeah. So, um, so these are so we have. I guess I'll start with we we operate. I guess I think it's twenty one irrigator pivots and I, th I think I think if I did the math right the other day I think we're like 4200 acres underwater or something like that I do believe so um, they're a lot of work but they're very valuable too if obviously if you need moisture but you can also um, inject um, inject things into them so um, so over here, this is a diesel powered one. Um, so it's running off of a, uh, I think this is a six cylinder. This pivot actually right here has a corner span on it. And it actually uh, covers about 320 acres. Um, so we are, uh, they have check valves in them and we'll have injection pumps. So over there on the left hand side, underneath the valley sign, there's a yellow diaphragm pump. And uh, that is what we inject. Um, the compost teas or extracts or you know any food sources or whatever you choose to inject that's what that's how we do it um but it's very it's been very very beneficial for us to be able to do this um and very economical um like i said we had to, to in order to aerate the tea we had to um use a generator which is it's kind of a pain in the butt but on a you can on these pivots, if, if other people have pivots, you can actually get a bigger inverter inside that valley panel. And you can actually, while that irrigator is running, you can actually, if you, as long as you have a big enough inverter, um, you can run a uh, 110 plug in there and just plug them right in mm -hmm. if that's something other people choose to do. Um, we ended up doing that to about, oh, I think we did 10, 10 of our pivots that way, um, which has been very, very handy if you need to aerate what next slide okay so this is this is a slide here where um this is how we this is how we transport a lot of the extract um and food sources so we we pull around this here is actually a picture of a 1200 gallon poly wagon tank uh we have 1600 gallons um Enduroplast makes some really nice tanks. They also have uh, like decks that you can actually put totes on them with food sources or however you want to do it. But we keep the extract in the tanks and then we have these cone bottom. You'll see the cones on the side where we'll inject the food sources in there as that extract is going to whatever you are applying. So um, the way we mainly apply it is through our planners. It's in springtime. 
and we are Thank using you. um we use uh, an ag excel system they're out of nebraska um cool. but they they came up with a orifice-less tube so instead of having the whole the orifices with just the little with the little uh holes in them um where you know if you get a piece of compost or whatever they're easily plugged these are like eight foot long hoses that have an orifice on it that that uh, bigger things are able to travel through to go down and put this around your seed um, and from there it goes into uh, we call like a total totally tubular tube um, which is like a stainless steel tube that that the extract drops right in front of where the seed is actually being planted in the furrow but these tanks help us get it to the sprayers, you know, uh, planters. Uh, we have several of these. We actually have some bigger trucks. You can put it in. We have stainless steel tankers that we can move it in, you know, however uh, you're set up to do. But um, the main thing is when you're when you're when you're pulling around extract or any any of these biologicals, make sure that you know you're doing your due diligence to keep things clean. Um, that is a big deal. You're um, you're flushing with water. Um, your cleaning, we, we do use, uh, if we get rained out or whatever, we're, we're using a product called Sanidate to help sanitize our, our planters, our sprayers, our tanks, um, certain things like that. It's, it's more like a vinegar solution. Um, but do your due diligence to make sure that you are being very, you know, thoughtful of, of, and cleanly, you know, clean. Yeah, that's a, yeah, Adam knows I'm a big stickler for disinfecting and cleaning. These guys have yep. a great job at, you know, uh, putting a program together. And just, just to uh, explain this, what you're looking at here, too, and as Adam knows, what, one of the nice things about this system is it also uh, does a great job at mixing the food sources, the, the yeah. counts and then the molasses. So that pump will circulate the biology and the food together and mix it all up. So you have really good, you know, uh, a mixed combination. It doesn't just put it in the tank. It actually circulates it. Yeah. So, and, yeah, and it's actually injecting it right into the line as it going in. So it's just, I mean, it's right. it's blending very, I mean. And it's all two-inch pipe, awesome. which is nice. And, and then you have a motor so you can run it slow. So it's minimally invasive. It's not like one yeah. speed. Some of these pumps, you know, you, you crank them up full bore and you're just slicing and dicing. With this system, mm -hmm. you can really passively move the biology into the tank and get everything mixed up nicely without you know causing too much disturbance yeah we've done a lot of checks from you know before the pump after the pump you know certain things like that to make sure that we're not doing ill harm yep or as much ill harm no the great rigs yeah so uh this is this one of our sprayers um can we, we will... start can we start from when you first started spraying though? So, so Adam, when I first met with Adam, we were spraying, these guys were spraying the uh, extract out with, they only had one rig. I mean, these things aren't cheap and Adam could tell you how expensive they are. And so they were using a existing rig that was also, they were spraying herbicides out of, you know, like Surflan and some of these other things. And it's very, very difficult to try to flush out any kind of pesticides that are in these things. But when you're first starting off, I mean, there's no other way to do it. So uh, maybe you want to just take over and kind of explain how we talked about removing screens and trying to get yep. the, the materials out and flushing and disinfecting and and you went to another. Yeah, so yeah, so it's kind of a big process, but you know we'll we'll do the same thing. You know we're, we're very, you know just being a disinfecting things just because anything harmful can. You know, I mean you just you don't want to be wasting your time um, if you're trying to do something good by by smoking it by just being lazy or or whatever just not cleaning. So. Um, so on these sprayers, you know, they have pipes and they have caps and they have, I mean, there's, there's a lot of lines and stuff, but we did our due diligence. You have to make sure that you flush everything out. Um, we used hot water, you know, we, we, we just went through and just pretty much, uh, you know, everything, but, you know, getting inside the lines and getting in there and cleaning them ourselves. I mean, we, we pretty well, anything and everything that you could clean, you did, we put new, um, uh, sight gauges on them um, and ran sanidate through them uh, let them sit in the booms for a day and then at the end of the day or the next day you flush it back out with with warm water and uh, and get these things really clean um, we took 
So when we were running compost, we were uh, with compost extracts, we were running a 50 mesh screen. We were taking some of the other screens out, but we would keep the 50 mesh in and um, would really be pretty good because actually we're screening it with a 50 mesh screen before it hits the tank. So it's, it actually works pretty decent um, at that. Um, we've used some um, Oh, Turbo T tips, um, oak sixes. We've had pretty good luck with them. Um, you can use a flood tip. You can, you know, use whatever. But the bigger hole, bigger the hole, the better off you're going to be just to help, you know, from plugging tips with, you know, you're always going to get a few fines in there from, from any extract or any compost source. Um, and that's really good stuff. But you want to you keep it. But you just don't want to, you don't want to also be cleaning your tips and, you know, times some times money sometimes so yeah the key is really to get as much volume out with minimized pressure and adam kind of knew this right from the get-go and looking at all the different tips because these rigs have multiple tips on a spiral uh on on that boom and uh adam i don't know did you actually have to get tips or did you have tips on there already that you could use? No, we had we had tips you know and each tip just depending on what we were trying to accomplish you know we were trying to keep the psi somewhere right you know around 35 40 you know um you just didn't want to be blowing it out there 60 70 or 80 you know and and doing a lot of damage so um a lot of guys that do a lot of their own spraying they they kind of have an idea mm -hmm. you know but we were doing 15 gallon the acre um using uh tj sixes um okay and having really good luck with those yeah so then you ended up going from uh one rig that did it all to actually dedicating and getting a, a sprayer just for doing biologicals and uh, nutrients and yeah like i said we're, we're heavily invested now we got a new oh, shed yeah. and a sprayer so uh what does a rig like that cost again just so everybody knows yeah they're expensive i don't know they're more expensive now because everything's went up but i you know you're gonna spend 300 on one pretty easy 250 yep. to 300 so what size boom is that one that we're looking that's at? 120 foot boom there yeah. all right uh, there you go yeah so this is a cool picture um that's the one i was talking about earlier yeah yeah so this is one of our farms here we have a neighbor conventional farm on the left and then our farm is on the right um you do see um you know, we have cut, you know, a lot of these things that I talked about earlier, we've cut out and you can kind of see, you know, you can see that the, the crop on the right, even though we're doing a lot of things different, looks very beautiful to me compared to, you know, the conventional side. Um, and that's what's, when you kind of go through this transition, this is something that's really interesting because you'll get a lot of neighbors or I've had a lot of neighbors around us that are conventional and the, the, you know, they're talking about you somehow or another or, behind your back or to your face or whatever but um you know a lot of these crops are artificially that these these uh, conventional guys are growing are artificially painted you know with high nitrates so we've we've tested neighbors and our you know ourselves too with 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 having so much nitrogen down on this conventional stuff they're just the nitrates are sky high um and you know that's bringing in you know disease insects and everything else under the sun but um you know so when neighbors drive by and if ours is not as green they'll you know they'll they'll you know um get on get on you a little bit but um but once you start really figuring out why theirs is so green it's, um it makes complete sense yeah but we're seeing you know where everything's dead on their side um you can see on our side where we got a lot of a lot of grasses um, um that are that are growing and um so yeah we've and we've also fought different weed species and what a lot of our neighbors have had we've transitioned to more grasses and and not so much of the the pig weed and the water hemp that a lot of other guys in our area fight which are actually on the other side we'd see can't see it from this picture there's patches of water hemp and pig weed throughout that field and on your field we just couldn't even find any it was just mostly grasses which is really cool mm -hmm. uh, so dollars and cents adam you know, like by the acre, um, what kind of, what would the yield difference be between the neighbor on the left versus what you yielded that, let's say that year? And, but, and then also what would the cost difference be roughly on what he would spend an acre, his cost versus your cost? 
Yeah. So, um, what I, what I've talked to even still, I mean, I have friends that are still, um, in the conventional side and, and, you know, um, Oh, they're still you know, your friends. I'm joking. Yeah. I mean, they, I mean <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, we, we all, we all, you know, have our, have our own thought process, but you know, they're still our neighbors and you know, everything else. And, uh, so, the, the guys that are doing the conventional are just mainly focusing all their money on, um, obviously potash, which is potassium DAP, uh, which is phosphorus, um, anhydrous ammonia and, um, doing a lot of roundup. Um, so by the time that they get done spending their money, plus doing a lot of seed treatments, um, I would say doing the way we're doing it and going to the non GMO, we're, you know, somewhere between depending on the farm and your situation, whatever, you can easily be a hundred to $150 an acre cheaper than your neighbor. Um, but what the is that thing I, a dollar? I mean, like, what would it, what are they spending an acre? Are they spending 500 to 800 dollars an acre now? Well, every, you know, that's 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 always that's a loaded question um, <laughs> because everybody has different. I mean, inputs are inputs, but people have a lot of different overheads. Some people are paying 500 dollars cash rent, you know, um, so everybody is. That's a loaded question. It's that's a hard one to really answer, to be honest but for with you. General, but, generally, that type of crop that's uh, you know uh, feed corn, it's grown conventionally. I mean, there's got to be some generalization to what these guys are spending with GMO corn and all the inputs. Yeah, I mean, I'm here to tell you that GMO corn is going to cost you three hundred twenty, three thirty a bag if you go fully traded, and non-GMO is going to be one hundred fifty to one hundred seventy. Um, but isn't it conceivable that these farms, these guys could be spending 500 to $800 an acre all in? Oh, there's guys that's got a lot more money in it than that. Right. Right. So you could, what technically you could save, you could cut that in half, right? Within three to five years, if not more. Uh, yeah. I mean, you, I don't know if you, I mean, you're never going to change your land expense is going to be your land expense. You know, your, you know, your fuel expense goes down. Um, you know, your insecticide expense goes to nothing if you choose to do that. Your your seed corn and seed beans, you can you can cut a lot of that out. Um, you know, so you can cut a lot of your inputs off. But you know, some guys have you know, the per acre cost. It depends on what the guy's overhead is too. You have fuel. I mean, you have uh, equipment. You have land cost. I mean, you have a lot of that type of stuff. But on the input side, yes, you could cut a lot of that down by 150 dollars an acre pretty easy depending on you know how you choose to go but um but i think in this picture here we, we've tested a lot of uh bricks on a lot of gmo plants over the years and um it, it's all per relatively pretty similar every year is a little bit different but um and you know this is these are these are gmo plants in a in a non that we've tested against in a non-biological system um if you you know a lot of times we'll see bricks levels from four to five um we have seen them up to eight um depends on this year but uh, but when you start getting into the biological program and you get more into the uh non-gmo crops and just just doing things better um you see that bricks level jump up and be twice it's not not hard to see that be twice as good as what um um some other guys around the area are doing so the other thing that's kind of really interesting about this picture is where you have the ears of corn we've seen this a lot um in a lot of growers around uh the area is you know they're spreading a lot of high rates of fertilizer high rates of nitrogen and and really boosting that energy up early but uh you, you see the tip back really bad late um where what we've been doing and trying to feed the the crop um you know, throughout the season, um, not do everything at one time, try to keep that energy level up and, you know, your biological activity fed and, and going, you can do a lot better job of being able to fill that ear out to the tip. Um, and at the end of the day, when you're trying to cut some of your costs early, you have more money that you are able to spend if you need to late in the season, you're not budgeted out at the end of the day. So, um, those are some things that we've seen, and it's been it's been it's been very rewarding um, to be able to see that and try to figure that stuff out. Because years, you know, in the methods that I was farming and grew up and taught farming, I mean, it was it was very typical to see that tip back from year to year, and it was like, oh, it's normal. Hell, 
everybody said, well, that's just, you just, you know, you got the right population. And no, that's not normal. That's money and effort that you spent that you did not fill out your, your full potential is what that really truly means. Well, and Adam, for folks who don't, haven't worked much with corn specifically, um, help us understand, do the kernels, the kernels back here are the ones that develop first, right? So this tip back really means that it like was boom, 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 and then ran out of steam. Yep, ran, right. ran out of steam is exactly right. It, it just ran out and it started cutting back and um, it would go like, you know, probably, you know, real similar for certain crops, whether it's soybeans or whatever, and you don't, you had the pods that were created, you know, and the beans that were created, but you did you ran out of energy and you didn't fill them or they, you know, they have blanks or, or whatever. You know, the other thing about any grain crops that we've been growing is, is, um, you know, the, the more nutritional, the more balanced you are in everything, biology, minerals, you know, everything all around the, the more balanced your crop is going to be the, you know, the better your, the fruit is going to be, the better the, the grain or however, it's going to be more nutrient dense. And it's also going to have a lot more weight to it as well as what we've found. Yeah, so it's more nutrient dense. When you talk about energy, Adam, um, I'm assuming you're talking about all things like maximizing photosynthesis, converting complete proteins to uh, com uh, completing, you know, having the nitrates convert to complete proteins and then you get lipid production. So your plants are going from an active to passive resistance. And so you have a really, you know, all in all this energy. Are you talking about all the different things that occur both biologically and chemically, or are you talking about certain minerals like yeah. nitrogen? Yeah, I mean, nitrogen's part of it, you know, getting that converted over to an amino acid protein, you know, as soon okay. as possible. Um, yeah, it's, it's everything, Todd, you know, I mean, um, it's biologically, you know, and keeping, I think a lot of the energy has to do with keeping your biological fed um, and keeping them active throughout the growing season. I mean, it's just, just trying to keep that energy up throughout the season. Um, right. You know, if you're running low on a on a, a specific mineral or whatever that is, you know, um, just so we can just, we can theorize then that because of all the biology work that you've been doing in your soils, now it's actually maintaining your minerals or your energy in the soil. Well, once yes. it didn't have that charge or that you know the battery in the soil, so that yep. what you're seeing is contributing to the kernels probably growing out there further right and that you have this lo longer term energy yeah and i think it has to do with that and also like i said is is keep keeping them fed and just keeping making sure that you know you're doing the best of your ability to keep you know things synergistic and, and not so oh we lost that we lost him i think we just lost Adam. well i was i was gonna also say you can even see it right here right like so they both all corn plants have these support roots, right? These yeah. wide ones that are out there to help keep them upright. And that's what the Western corn rootworm will attack and knock, knock the plant over. Um, but the fine root hairs, you can see the amount of just detail in there. Those are the surface areas that are enabling yeah. microbes to access and exchange with this plant that enables that plant to have that long-term seed production throughout the season. One of the things yeah. that Brad's been really, I mean, Adam and Brad have been really great about, we're not only very intelligent farmers, but they, they do a lot of work also looking at the bricks and the sap testing. They do quite a bit of sap testing and they do supplemental foliar sprays when and if needed while these crops are going through this transition of, you know, being chemical dependent to more biological. And they've uh, been really innovative with their foliar sprays. And I think that's another reason he talks about this extended uh, energy they're getting. I think some of it also has to do with the sap testing and foliar sprays. Unfortunately, he's not here to ask the question, but um, that was one of the things I did want to ask him. Well, so, Todd, do you know if he has, you know, he extensively assesses the biology in his soil. Mm -hmm. So he theoretically would have data that could be correlated one to the next also, right? Absolutely. So, oh, yeah. That would yeah. be a beautiful thing to start to playing with. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's a lot of the work, uh, I think, that 
the future of a lot of the work that I'm doing is, and I'm sure Todd's same way, is how do you become much more specific in that transition period so you can reduce the amount of those inputs that the farmers are requiring to maintain the production while you're doing that transition. Right. And if you get very prescribed and you can minimize the amount, then you're having less impact to the microbiology. I mean, that's always the trade-off. Yeah. When you start putting on those agrochemical products, you're, you're taking some step backwards. How can we minimize those taking step backwards while we're going through a successful transition? Yeah. Right. Oh, we got Adam, Adam back. Yeah, so Adam, one of the questions I was gonna ask you quite a lot, yeah, is that I, I just assume that this was the case too, but I had mentioned that you guys are really, you know, very intelligent farmers and have done a lot of work with sap testing and doing foliar sprays as supplemental sprays going through this conventional to more sustainable and biological programs. So maybe you could touch a little bit on the benefits of doing the sap testing, doing the foliar sprays and, and being able to you know, how that's part of this energy, you know, regenerative energy uh, or reduced energy that you're not getting as much of because you're doing the sap testing in the foliar sprays. Yeah, so I think it's, I think it's a good thing to be able to test your, your sap test. It's, you know, throughout the growing season, I think it's great to test, uh, take samples of uh, the soil, to kind of see where you're at biologically as well um, throughout the season and just try to adjust accordingly. I think if um, the, the foliar sprays are very beneficial, um, the one thing that we've been working on, uh, we've been doing a lot of testing is uh, mixing some uh, minerals with the compost extracts as well. Um, we've been doing a little bit of work with that. Um, having pretty good luck with that. Haven't done a, a lot of it, you know, in the past, I've, I've kind of played around with it, but that's something that uh, we're going to be really looking at, um, you know, bringing some of the minerals with the, with the biology, um, you know, through certain testing, if, if you need those, those minerals as well. So, um, and that helps with the energy and just helps, you know, increase your, your bricks, um, you know, and just, and doing the due diligence, you know, having a refractometer and, and, uh, doing, you know, whatever foliar spray that you choose to do, but, you know, make sure that when you're doing them, you're checking your bricks and, you know, you're, if, if you're getting the, the jump um, that you're looking for, then, you know, that's a good way of testing. And then you, you go to, to maybe doing some more acres with it. Um, if you're not seeing that jump, try to figure out why you're not seeing that jump. Um, if there's something in the mix that's maybe not um, rolling like you want it to, um, so that's that's a lot of things that we've been we've been doing and haven't been been very successful at, at doing that. Um, at, that's awesome. Just to, yeah. 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 So when you when you're adding a foliar amendment to a leaf, forgive me for not understanding the theory, but is the theory that that is then feeding and stimulating microbial growth that then protects and and supports the plant? So, yeah. So if you are, you know, kind of what we found out too is if if so over the years if we've degraded soil or some farms have been degraded you're not having the, the organic matter you know there that you would um that you had 60 years ago so some of these negatively charged minerals are not just and depend on your situation too if you have you know if you're sat you know if you've had too much rain or you know uh we've we've kind of fought uh, like boron for example you know we've had to feel like we've had to add boron um to get the levels up with it um so yeah, just just doing all the due diligence, I think, with testing and trying to, um, you know, only add what you need to, but also be very balanced about how you're adding things. And and when you're when you're uh, applying a good foliar, you're you're raising uh, the bricks in the plant, and you're you know you're photosynthesizing at a higher rate, which in tune is feeding feeding everything in the soil. So rock on. Yeah. And then I you get these benefits. Oh, sorry. No, no, okay. I think one of the things that we're seeing happening, especially with Adam, is that because we do a lot of work with compost and we're looking at putting minerals in compost and letting the microbes solubilize and convert these minerals to more plant available in the microbial biomass. And with Adam, you know, he's he's applying these these trace minerals. He's kind of looking at it like, you know, clients and farmers will use foliar sprays either in a chelated form or in a cation form, right? And it depends on, you know, what crop they're spraying, why they're spraying this. But I think when we're applying these minerals, these, these trace minerals with biology, the biology has the ability to break these things down further, like a chelate, but it's in the biomass of the microbes 
in the, you know, the bacteria and the fungi. And in nature, we all know that plants should have the biology and the leaf surface, right? And that, that, that film should have that biofilm on the plant. So when he's applying these extracts with the trace minerals, he's getting a better response with it because of that fact. And you're using less of those trace minerals and getting Correct. a better response. So it's almost like a chelated response, but it's actually a biological response because of the enzymes and the organic acids. Correct? Correct. Right. And that's what a lot of the minerals that we're using are already, you know, uh, chelated with um, amino acids, organic acids. They have humic in them, you know, some fulvic. Um, they're not EVTA like a lot of other products sold. You know, everything's jiving, and we, we do the due diligence and testing it with the biology and right. you know, so on and so forth. So, so the minerals are like a T-shirt cannon out into the crowd. Like. Yeah. And, you know, and, 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 when yeah. and when you're foliar and, you know, you're using it, you know, if a foliar, sometimes, you know, a lot of it's there's 10 to 15 times more efficient. So you're just using such minute amounts and um it's making some some really really big results so that's especially important you know these trace minerals when we're talking about the action of um leguminous plants you know it's worth mentioning because i work with a bunch of pasture producers here in oregon um visit their pastures and all and sometimes they are not getting good nitrogen fixation out of their um rhizobium that's associated with alfalfa or another um, thing that they're growing and you look at a soil chemical analysis and they have like almost no boron or something else that can interrupt that process and so really prescribing you know exactly the trace mineral it, it's something you can invest in when you're not investing so much in excessive right. npk right yeah yep. and adam's adam's uh and really great about that. You guys have been on that for a number of years now. And, yeah, and I mean, really, a lot of it has to do with understanding, really trying to know what your most limiting factor is. You know, um, biology is a big part of it. You know, there, there's a lot of different ones and it's going to differ for everybody. You know, it's just having to do your own due diligence and just try to do the proper testing and, and you know, figure these things out and really just concentrate on on keeping a good balance of everything. Can you explain, which I think is fascinating, like the Enhume product? You know, you're using quite a bit less of it and getting like, what, how many times greater nitrogen from this product? Yeah, so so we've, we've, uh, we uh, have a product called Enhume, and it's uh, more or less, it's um, amine, nitrogen, and uh, humic acid. And um, so it's a foliar nitrogen product that we use on like our corn. And it we're doing four to five gallons to the acre with 20 gallon uh, mix and we will mix some kelp and, and certain you know, like a sea crop or uh, other things with it and um, we're folding it over the corn and you know at the end of the day it's, it's actually if we use four gallon it's like actual like 7.6 actual units of nitrogen but the efficiency, if you're using, you know, following the, the foliar recommendations, so you're spraying, you know, under 82 degrees, you know, uh, the humidity is where it needs to be. You know, some people have uh, where the moon phase is, even, you know, if you're uh, the most efficient is uh, where the energy is the highest is six days before a full moon. So if you're doing and following all these rules that uh, this, uh, this product could act like 10 to 15 times of the actual in in it, you know, so you might be actually, the plant's actually acting like it's getting more like 80 units of nitrogen instead of just the 7.6 because it's just so efficient. And it's in the, and it's in a, a form that the plant recognizes and wants it instead of being in like a, a nitrate or, right. you know, another form. This is a really important topic because a lot of people don't understand that when they're transitioning, they want, we want to find sources of nutrients like this nitrogen form that is less invasive to biology. It's not 100% organic, but yet it's a lot less in, uh, invasive to the biology, and it's a great transitional product to use, and you're using it at a much lower rate and getting much bigger bang from your, as your nitrogen source, right, Adam? I think it's a great, you know, way to, to, to transition to, you know, the actual organic forms of you know, like soy or some, a liquid soy or something like that, which gets really expensive. Uh, so the cost-wise, there's a real value there for folks that are transitioning from 
you know, we'll just say uh, something extreme like um, anhydrous ammonium or something like that or, or urea, you know what I mean? Uh, this is a great product to be using to during this transition. So I, I'm glad you mentioned, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned and talked a little bit about it. Todd, I'm really glad you brought that up, the a concept of transition, because so often um, what I run into, especially with some of my friends who are more on the traditional chemical agriculture paradigm still, is that they go, nobody has the um, economic capacity to do like a five-year transition and not make any money in the middle in the middle of all of that, right? And yeah. it's like, well, we know what the target can be. I, I, I have a friend that has research that shows you can get like 150 pounds per acre potentially mineralizable nitrogen just from um, some vetch as a cover crop in winter, you know? And But then how do we ease that transitionary period uh, before your soil biology is really taking off and running the show and keeping everything going? How do we, how do we create that um, shift in the ecosystem, right? So we bump it up to the right level where we really get the transformation that we're looking for. And I, it's such an important topic. In fact, I hope we can eventually make a whole course here at Soul Food Web School about nutrient management through the process of transitioning. Well, I think we, as long as we understand that we have all these different tools to our, you know, uh, tools to the, you, being able to have different tools to use to, and also the knowledge base to have, um, you know, it's just like, you know, someone might use uh, a, a high rate of an herbicide. Well, their, their water is really hard. And so they're only getting 50% efficacy at this full rate. Well, why don't we just soften the water? I mean, there's these simple little things that people need to understand as a one of many tools to cut back on the use of these chemicals or maybe using a surfactant. Um, you know, so there's multiple tools that we have in our toolbox now that we just know need to know or they need to know that we have. And so Adam that, has really done a great job at utilizing all the tools. I think the misconception that, that people have too is that in the transition phase, they're going to be losing money. Um, if you're smart about, I mean, Adam's proven right here that right. you're still in the transition phase and you're already seeing massive cost savings. And oh, those yeah. cost savings will tend to, you know, accelerate as you're going farther through that transition. But yeah, it's not like, oh, for five years, oh, I got to take a hit financially. Uh, that, I don't think yeah, that's the no, case. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think you have to, you know, I don't, and right. I, who wants to do that anyways? You know, I don't, <laughs> you know, so, I mean, but I think that goes back to the education and surround yourself with, with people that, that, um, that, you know, no more than you do at that point in time and just learning and, and trying to figure out, all right, what's the, what's the best, what's the best economical way that I can do this and, and not go under, you know? So that's everybody's right. fear, you know? Yeah, you never go backwards and lose you know, money. Yeah. We're going to, right. every year we're going to get closer and closer to the 100% goal of this is, uh, you know, up there in the stratosphere. Um, in the first year we're getting, you know, 100 miles above the surface of the planet. And the next year we're going to get a little higher, a little higher. And finally, all right, we're up there. Now what else can I use to uh, minimize the costs? So it takes a little while. Or maybe we can figure out exactly how we go from what you're missing to having the full food web and if we really work on it and and focus we can get to that 100 percent the soil biology is right on what it should be and so you can realize things in the first growing season yeah observation is important too i know the last time i was at adams one of the things i noticed pretty clearly the difference between his fields in the fall, Adam, and the residual, you know, how much more coloration and, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, you know, the decomposing going on was mm -hmm. quite a difference from your, the conventional fields, you know, the, uh, the, the gray color that, you know, that was really a, a noticeable difference. And, uh, you know, this last, uh, I don't know if this is the last slide, but it talks about, you know, on ongoing proof that biology systems can work well visually those are the you know you mentioned earthworms and and then also the rhizomorphs and the mushrooms now that we're seeing in your fields they weren't there before but this fall residual program that you guys have has looks i mean visually you can really see it right 
So, so, fantastic. Uh, I love it. Just as a timekeeper, I know we're going to get to the very end of this. What I'll actually, Adrian, can we throw out the one last question? I think this is a perfect question for Adam to kind of end the Q&A on. Um, sorry to put you on the spot like that. <laughs> yep, you're good. I forgot to reset. Here we go. No problem. But Adam, this question is, is really for you. And I think this is a great webinar. And the question is from Norm, which is, you spoke a lot about your cost savings, et cetera. I'm mm -hmm. interested if you have experienced any quality of life changes that you Great. cannot put a cost on. I think this is yes. a fantastic way to end this. <laughs> yes, that is, that is a great question. I love that question. Yes. Um, I'm going to bring up a story um, that back when we were, we were, we were planting, um, you know, everybody was like, hey, we need to get more yield, more yield, more yield. That's what everybody had talked about. And so that was more insecticide, more whatever. I got to a point where I was loading the planter with a product, uh, liquid, pest, or liquid insecticide. And um, I got some on my hands. And I was planting corn. And I couldn't feel my legs for about half of the day. And you talk about being scary and being like, you know, I mean, I have little children at home and you start you start factoring in the health issues when it comes to being around um, you know certain chemicals, certain insecticides, something like that. What is the value on that? What's the value on on your health? What's the value on um, you know the type of food you put in your body? You know that's you know that if you know everybody's always told me if you don't have health you have nothing. It doesn't matter how much money you got in the bank or it doesn't matter how much land you farm. It doesn't matter any of this type of stuff. At the end of the day, if you don't have health, you really don't have anything. So. I do believe that value is is a lot greater than than any financial savings at the end of the day. Yep, and yet we aren't told um, from the chemical companies the dangers that you're actually dealing with with any of these toxic chemicals. Uh, you know, it's like glyphosate was always, oh, you know, there's no harm in it, it doesn't hurt human beings at all. Now we discover that it causes a really severe terminal cancer that there's really nothing you're going to do about it except maybe prolong for a few years and so how can you trust any of those um those asides you want to get off of them as rapidly as possible for your health and for your children's health yeah so, so health and the food that you're growing whether it's going into cattle or whatever's going whatever